Jerry Learns Business. We have a very special guest. He's an actor. We go to the same church, in fact, guys. So this is Econ. Econ, welcome, man. Hey, what's up, Jerry? Kenny, can we please talk about this? All you do is talk. I'm done. No, 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 please, please. Just listen. I won't say anything. Kenny! You're okay? He's been stabbed, left side. Looks like he passed out, then hit his head in the crash. Any ID? Not that I can find. An app? Yeah. I didn't know you knew how to use a computer. <laughs> no, I'm just on the business side of things. That's cool. You could be one of the first ones in. I'm just saying, if you want to get a business off the ground, you got to have as much capital as possible. There it is. And what's that supposed to mean? I'm not giving you a loan. When did you sort of get this bug to want to be a performer, to be an actor? Funny thing is, so my name's Econ, and I actually was an Econ major in college. <laughs> so <laughs> that gives you an idea of what my focus was. My focus was not acting. Um, I grew up with, uh, to be honest, I can't even really pinpoint the, the time that I really wanted to act. I probably had dreams of it growing up in like high school, but I wouldn't dare touch it. Mm -hmm. um, my, my family was very traditional Chinese. Uh, I got good grades. I played tennis. You know, every Asian, a Asian kid plays tennis. Uh, I played piano. Um, and artistically, piano was probably the closest thing that I ever got. I, I, I competed and I, I played classical, classical piano, um, but didn't at all have anything to do with acting. If anything, my, my, my dad's main focus was me to uh, go to math grad school and become a professor, which he, he is a, a, as well. Um, so I didn't touch it. Not until college did I kind of do some like stage shows with buddies, um, you know, goofing around, nothing serious. I mean, no, no one, no one at all took it seriously. I, I, it wasn't like I was like, Hey, I'm actually practicing to become a real actor. Like no one, no one at all was, was thinking that I was actually going to become an actor after college. And, um, so needless to say, I was a math and econ major. And, um, and then after that, I just moved to LA and I just jumped in and I just, wanted to see what it was all about and, and never looked back since, so. That moment we decided to move to LA, what was it like? Did you like consult mentors? Did you talk to people working in the industry already? Or was it kind of just like, I don't know many people, let's just, let's just go for it. It's one of those things, hindsight's twenty twenty. but the, the best benefit is not knowing what you're doing because you don't want a million reasons why, your brain is gonna come up with a million reasons why not to do something, especially so risky. Um, uh, without a doubt, had nothing to do with LA. Knew no one. I uh, uh, drove out with a uh, with my buddy from college, who also wanted to become a filmmaker. He, he was he was uh, wanted to be more behind the camera, so directing and writing and so on. So we were putting shows on together in college. He flew out to Jersey. I drove out my car from Jersey cross country, and we had no plan. We had no money. We had no job. And as far as the, uh, the industry was concerned, I knew absolutely nothing. Personally, for me, it didn't really, <laughs> this is a bad, uh, bad sign, but I actually didn't even think about it that much because we both wanted to do it and we're like, hey, why don't we just go out to LA? There, it was about as much pre-planning as that. Um, and I, anyway, sorry, I, I lost track. Your, your question is, is how much do we actually have, how much roots we had in LA? We had absolutely nothing. Mm. So we were starting out from scratch. And um, to be honest, I'm one of those few people that, even though I'm a transplant, essentially, I've been out here for, for a while now, but I, I loved LA from the beginning. I absolutely loved it. We were struggling. I worked at Urban Outfitters for my first job. Um, uh, uh, and just seeing what the city had to, to offer and then eventually made myself a, a pretty good life. So. Um, no, it, it's been a, it's been a wild ride, but we, we, we planned nothing. Wow. wow. <laughs> Tell me about when you first got here, what were some of the things in LA? I say here because I live in LA too, but for those watching, you know, you might not be in LA. What were the things in LA that you were like, Ooh, this is exactly like I thought it was. And what were the things that you're like, Oh wow, this is completely different from what we thought. You know, it's so funny you say that because. At least, well, I mean, obviously, I, I established I'm from Jersey. I was born and raised on the East Coast. So a lot of people would have said, uh, uh, if you're going to get into the industry, why not go to New York? New York was too close. So it was something brand new. I'm not going to lie. 
this, this is about as little planning as we did. I don't even know what my perception was of LA. Like I, I, I distinguish basically the East coast is very New Jersey. I, I, we're, we're close to Philly. So Philly, New York, it's kind of like that mindset. You just kind of go out, you go out there and do it. There's no BS. Um, I didn't even think about the differences of the West coast until you actually see it for yourself. I didn't think about, Oh, it's always 75 degrees. And, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, people walk slower and, you know, I didn't even think about the cold. I, I was also, you know, uh, younger. I wasn't like in high school, but I, I, I didn't even think about that, let alone, what it was going to be like to actually go out on auditions and learn about the acting industry. I was, I was a fresh baby where it's like, Oh, this is pretty fun. And it was, it was as, li it was as, um, uh, uh, limited as that, which is great because I didn't have expectations. So I wasn't going to be uh, disappointed. Um, the weather's great. I loved, I, I, I love the sun. And, and uh, I mean, obviously that's a big, that's a big uh, selling point. I actually went to school in Chicago. So you can imagine, East Coast weather, then going to Chicago. I mean, I, I, I get why LA people never, never leave. <laughs> I, it's funny because I, I spent a few years in Chicago too. I, I spent a few years oh, of my right. childhood in Chicago. So I have very fond memories of Chicago. And I also, I spent about six years in Philly. So it's really funny that I know exactly the type of environment you spent your before LA journey. That's funny you say that. So, um, you know, I, I, and this is another thing where, Kind of like what you were talking about is like we're, we're kind of talking about developing as a, a as an actor, but when it comes down to it, it, like for me, and this is a lot to do with like how I look at life now. I mean, this is looking back over years, but it wasn't even so much just me developing into an actor; it was me developing into someone who's creative, someone who's you know I would kind of say like leaning towards that artistic world, especially considering I was like a math and econ major, and I was starting to get more curious. Uh, and unfortunately, growing up on the East Coast, I grew up in the suburbs of, of South Jersey. I wasn't exactly adventurous. I wasn't going to Philadelphia like on the weekends and getting into trouble or, or exploring the city. And then even in Chicago, it's like a great theater town and, and comedy town like that. I kind of was stuck. Like, I, you know, not stuck. I, I had a great time in college, but, you know, I was goofing all of my friends, but I didn't explore the city as much as I wish. So now I feel like that's how I look at LA and whenever I travel, it's like really soaking in the culture, everything a city has to offer, different foods, you know, like side note, like I also picked up a job. I, I'm, I'm like a, a part-time blogger for like a food and fun things to do blog in LA. So it's like, you can imagine, it's like, I'm, I'm just soaking it all in. But um, yeah. that's great that you got to, got a taste of Chicago and Philly. It's really funny to hear you talk about how, um, you know, when we're younger, we don't appreciate when we are really in like a cool environment. Um, besides Philly and, and Chicago, I had quite a few years living in the Washington, D.C. area. And like you, I was the same. I mean, you know, I was a pretty good student. I studied on the weekends. I never went into Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, to get in trouble or like just explore. And so it's funny that like once I came to L.A., I said to myself, okay, I'm not going to be like that anymore. So I'm always trying to do new things. And I always one of these cities, you can live here for all your life and there's still neighborhoods you don't explore just because LA is so spread out. So um, that's, if anyone wanted some advice as to, you know, how to find good things in a new city, it's just explore it, right? That's, that's something to learn. Just to explore it. Don't just stick to one area. I had a friend who moved out here. He's not a friend. He's just a classmate I had in, High school, you know, some sometimes I gotta distinguish those words because you know you gotta use you gotta right, treat right, right. friendships carefully, and that's a conversation we talk about soon about LA too. But he came out to LA, and for a year, he never got together with me. I was trying to get together with him. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're here in LA, like that's what I'm talking about. Like, so certain people they come out here, and I get it, it's an intimidating city, and they just like never leave their neighborhood. Or there's some people growing up in LA too; they'll never leave the neighborhood they yeah. grew up in. So that's a good piece of advice for anyone entrepreneurial, anyone who wants creative inspiration, just go explore. You know, that brings up a great point because it's also, it's kind of like what you're talking about. Like people take it for granted. I can't even imagine growing up in LA. If I was growing up and went to high school in LA, growing up in the, in the quote unquote, the heart of Hollywood, and then 
it would have completely changed my, my outlook on life. And maybe I wouldn't have even gone into the Hollywood industry because I was be so jaded about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like how you are, because I know that me and you are, are kind of very similar. It's like, we're both really curious. It's, it's the idea that even though that you might've missed out on a few years of exploring the city, it's like, it's one thing to regret. Um, and I, 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 I personally try not to regret a lot of things. If anything, it's take advantage and, and make a change and you start exploring more and then I start exploring more where it's like you can't dwell on uh, not traveling or exploring the city. You know, you just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Go ahead and travel, soak it in and at least make some, make some changes and, and, and take advantage because life is short, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I'm learning from you already, Econ, is that when you came to LA, you had a really good mentality, which is, I'm not going to expect anything. You know, I'm just going to let it flow. And a lot of people come to LA with like certain mindsets, right? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to like make it or, oh, I'm going to be in this circle or that circle. It's like, no, you just came out and you're like, I'm just going to give it a go. No expectations, nothing. And I think that's very healthy. Because yeah. then you live yeah. in the moment. Uh, so uh, that's something for anyone on an entrepreneurial path or anyone on a creative path. I think that's a great thing to learn from econ. Just like, don't be like, I'm going to make a million dollars or I'm going to fail. Don't think that way either. Just be like, okay, that's what I'm doing now. Let's just do it. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I can always think back and say, oh, what would it be like to go to college for acting? And then it would have been. Like I much rather me be almost becoming an adult, getting a better understanding of who I am and then jumping into it. But you bring up a great point. It, it's that, um, you know, it's the idea that, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if we're talking about specifically acting, uh, the main thing is, and it's one of those things where it's like, my goal was, hey, maybe I can make a career of this. Maybe I could survive. Um, I didn't want to do anything regarding, like I didn't want to work for a bank or, or do something in an office. So my expectations were super, uh, super reasonable. If anything, that was, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't really fail because the expectations were, were, were reasonable. I didn't come out here saying I need to be the next, I need to be famous. I need to make a million dollars. I need to get uh, these kind of accolades or achievements because when it comes down to it, especially with, uh, specifically the Hollywood industry, it's, it's, it's so unknown and out of your power that the quicker I got used to them and realized that it was a marathon, um, the happier I would be. And to be honest, that's the main, that's the main way I look at life. I, that's the main way I look at life now. Yeah. It's like, you know, obviously in our situation right now is, is even more unknown. Yeah. But the fact that even before COVID, it's like the acting industry, that, that's the beauty and that's the excitement of it. But you can't go into it thinking that it's like I'm going to rise the ranks of working for a, a hedge fund or a bank. I mean, it, it's just not realistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I yeah, think I um, listening to you use that word, I found the title of this talk, which is the marathon of being an actor. I think that's a great <laughs> way to title this video. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, people are going to think I'm 75 years old working in the industry for that long. But yeah, I'm, I'm cool with it. <laughs> so let's um, talk more about that marathon. So, you know, you came out here and you're working for, you said Urban Outfitters. And then yeah, yeah. when did you, when did you kind of like feel like, okay, I'm starting to understand what I have to do as an actor. Was it like your first year, your second year, you know, your third year, et cetera. You know, it, 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 I don't even remember the, the huge, uh, I think it's different for everyone, but I think what, what I would say is there's a couple of things. There are a lot of people who come out here with the idealized, uh, uh, um, the notions that I'm an actor, I'm going to quit a day job, or I'm not going to have a day job. And personally for me, I think, and here's the thing, I'm not, everyone's situation is different, but you can easily look at any creative endeavor and say, this is what I need to feel like an artist, which I think is kind of an illusion that we may, may make up in our head. I personally always had a side job, always knew that I, I, I knew that I didn't want to have to be scared about where my next paycheck was. So I had that work ethic going into it. And then as far as the acting is concerned, I just let that ride as far as discovering on my own. Um, that being said, I didn't give myself a timeline. A lot of people say two years, if I don't get some footing in two years, I'm like, first of all, I didn't go to school for acting. It's like, how am I going to know anything in two years? I was busy 
goofing off for two years and then like it, it took me a while just acclimating to LA, let alone knowing that LA was going to be possibly my home. Also, uh, uh, living life and getting an understanding of what life was like going to be in LA. So a lot of people are like, I got to hit the ground running in the first six months. I need to do everything. And then that's kind of like the idea of the marathon versus the sprint. Um, to be fair, I, and this is another thing that, that we learn. Um, I didn't get into the acting classes that I needed to be in until maybe a few years later than I, than I did. So there was always part of me that, you know, I felt like I was completely naive. I mean, also acting classes are completely different now than they were, you know, back then. But, um, uh, uh, as far as going in fresh, I was like, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll go into auditions. My idea of the industry, I didn't really understand it until at least five years. And to be honest, there's no book, there's no class. You can, re you can read, there, there's some stuff on the internet will give you an idea, but not until you really know what to do. You pretty much have to ask someone who's been through it and you got to live through it. And then there's no speeding up that process. You just got to, you just got to embrace, embrace the process and embrace the work. So that's just getting used to auditioning. That's not even class yet. So talk about paying for class, paying for headshots. It's like, obviously actors know how much money we have to like funnel into the industry. And then of course, everyone's ran into a scam. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of scams. So it's like, that's all just getting a, co a comfortable side job that you can do while that's flexible paying for all that stuff, hopefully getting into an acting class and then working on your craft. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm not going to get into the weeds too much, but a lot of people who went to fancy acting schools in college come out in LA and they realize it's a completely different beast. So either way you're battling wherever you came from and you're battling your own pride because uh, uh, either way you're going to have to learn how it is in LA. So fast forward to, to get into what you're, what you're saying eventually I got into class and the classes that I needed those a hundred percent I did not uh, shy away from because it's essentially my acting college that I didn't pay for so I was very fortunate um, that uh, I didn't have a, a, a bunch of student loans my parents were were really education focused and they were very I was very fortunate that um, they were able to provide but also um, they were very understanding of me taking this career path. And then next thing in that, investing in myself, I'm still working. I'm still in class. I'm still in class right now. I'm in a class that I don't, I'm constantly learning and constantly honing on the craft. And then that's in addition to, um, you know, among everything else that I'm doing. But um, yeah, so I, I kind of had to build that work ethic, you know, after goofing off for a few years. Um, but yeah, you, you, you pretty much never really learn that until you actually are, are going through it. So, um, yeah. but for me, it was definitely, I think five years is a little more realistic to be like, it, for, forget giving yourself five years to like make it in acting, give yourself five years and see where you are as a person. And then, I mean, who, there's no harm in, in, in figuring out that you don't want to act in the first place and find something else. LA has a million things to do. Exactly. So that's kind of like my mindset is like, we're always changing. We're always adapting and, and, and learning. So there's never any uh, absolutes, you know? Anyway. And I really want to emphasize something that Econ talked about, which is the timeline thing, right? Give yourself a realistic timeline. Once you understand that anything that you want to do for yourself, whether start a business, be an actor, so anything entrepreneurial, anything creative, even if you want to get into politics, you know, a lot of these things, it's a marathon. So I remember when I thought about, okay, I'm just going to go and YouTube and that's how I'm going to make money. I remember my parents, because at the time I was working at this pretty prestigious Chinese company and I was miserable, but you know, I was like, I, I think I can do what I'm doing because I have so many skills, but I can do it for myself. And my parents are like, okay, so what's your timeline? Like, you got to give us a timeline or else you can't come home and like try to do it at home, you know, with, with free rent. Wow. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, I can't do that because their timeline is going to be like, if you don't make it in six months or if you don't like make money on YouTube in a year, wow. you're not going to, you're, you're, we're going to like make you go to grad school or something. Right. And so I did exactly what Econ did. I slave through a corporate job for two more years before I could finally say, 
all right, it's time for me to just go full time and make a, make videos on YouTube. So the timeline thing is so important. You cannot say, oh yeah, I'm only going to give myself a year. On top of that, you also can't say, I'm going to just like hit the ground running and this is going to be the only thing I do. It's not realistic. A lot of entrepreneurs even, you know, they'll work maybe even five years, 10 years at another job before they are ready to take whatever venture and that be like what funds them. So I think I love it. What I love about Econ is he's very real. He's got that East Coast thing. He's not selling you on, oh yeah, you know, I just, it was so smooth sailing for me. No, no, he, <laughs> he, he like he admits that he didn't know what he was doing for quite a few years, but he slowly figured it out. And yeah. that's the marathon of all this, of entrepreneurship, of acting. You know, and I kind of love that, the fact that you said that, you know, you had to work a full-time job for a couple of years. What it did is it showed how much you wanted to do it. That's how much you, you have to work. That's how much how you had to uh, put yourself in a position to succeed. And when it comes down to it, it's a good reminder that when you're out here sludging around and some days are, are up and down, you realize this is what you work for and this is what your dream is, to be out here and be doing what you, you're doing. And I, I think that applies to all creative professions. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, the idea that, well, first of all, a, a funny side story. When I, I almost forgot about this. When I uh, first moved out here, I told my mom that I was moving to LA to jump into the industry. I did not tell my dad. Now, you're going to wonder, it's like, how on earth did my dad not know? I basically made up some stupid excuse or, or silly reason, and he bought it. He was obviously not happy, but I did it. I moved out to LA. I want to say I, I started at the very, you know, I started doing background, you know, just to be what it's on set. I didn't have any shame about it. I was like, I just want to be on set and see what, how these he, how these shows worked. Um, I was on an episode that actually was going to air on TV. And my mom and my dad, I told them, and they saw me in the background. It was like a Halloween episode. I was like dressed up as a pirate or something. And not until that moment did my dad go, what is Ika doing in LA again? Like, it was the most out of left field. Like, she kept her mouth shut for months. And I was like, the cat's out of the bag and I'm already across the country. So, I, I, you know, I might as well tell him. And, you know, obviously, as years went on, uh, my dad eased up on it. But it, it just goes to show you, it's like, you kind of have to not go with, say, for example, uh, 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 timelines, whatever they told you, whatever my parents would have said that was the sensible thing to do, whatever advice that people thought it 10 years ago, chances are you could probably throw it out the window. Yeah. How to break into LA, throw it out. How to start your own business. I think obviously now considering, you know, everyone's reshifting in this uh, uh, post COVID or COVID uh, 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 climate, it's whatever people were telling us 10 years ago or so on, even like diets, Diets drastically change. Whatever we grew up eating, they were wrong. Yeah. And I think it's that, that allowing ourselves to be like, hey, let's see what we really think and, and kind of uh, um, not, be, not be scared to take a risk. Anyway, I know that's all over the place, but It's yeah. so <laughs> important. It's so important what you say. And the other lesson I'm learning for you, it's something that I had to learn the hard way too, is um, it's good to get a lot of constructive criticism, but you really have to be careful of surrounding yourself with too much immediate negative feedback. You know, there are people in your lives who are going to give you good, like solid, like for your own good type of good advice. But what you have to avoid are those people who the first thing that comes out of their mind, no matter what you do is either criticism or like it's too candid because that for an entrepreneur, for anyone that wants to build something will really destroy your mood. And a lot of times it's your passion and your mood that's getting you going. So you cannot, that's like your biggest currency. And so I think what Econ did was he's like, okay, I have a feeling my dad, if he gives me too much input too early on in this, mm -hmm. it's not going to make me embrace this marathon. It might make me fall on my marathon run, right? So I had to learn that too. When I finally moved out to LA um, and said, I'm going to do it, there were some people in my life I had to be like, okay, every time I post something on Facebook, he's well-intentioned, but he's always, first thing he says is negative. 
And then he's like, oh, he might even delete what he said because he yeah, realized yeah, he's yeah. negative. But I was like, okay, yeah. that guy, I got to limit his interactions with me. Or it's like, um, yeah. you know, um, before I met Econ, I went traveling for a bit and I got hurt. And then, by the way, my neck is healed. It's great, by the oh, way. Oh, wow. That's so, yeah, it's great. So nice. um, I can tell you more about that later. But um, the beauty is when I moved back here, I was getting some more criticism, even though it's like shown, I built something here. So it's not like I'm moving out here and doing nothing. I'm just moving out here and continuing what I've already built. And still, I was getting criticism from people. And so like you, Econ, it was your dad. For me, it was my mom. And I literally, I had to put my mom on like limited profile too, not on Facebook. She's not on Facebook, but I had to make it so like- <laughs> The truth comes out, said, the truth comes out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like I had to make it so my mom, the majority of stuff she said couldn't reach me because the majority, some people, they're very extroverted. My mom's very extroverted. So she doesn't process things before she says it. So like, you know, um, I was promoting my friend's product. This is a wrestling glove. Oh, nice. And like- um, it's called Graps, right? So I guess shout out to Johnny. Johnny, I'm promoting you again. But I was promoting this in a video once. And my mom, her extroverted mind just said, Jerry, did you hurt your hand, man? Is your hand hurting? Why are you wearing a glove? Instead of like looking at the video, if she just watched the video, she would have been uh, like, oh, he's promoting his friend's company. But it's like, you know, you got to be careful with people like that because the fact that that's how they think they're already in this mindset of, okay, this person's going to fail. This person's going to do that. You cannot have too much of that when you're doing your own thing. I completely agree. You know, it, it brings up a great point. Like, to be honest, my, like, you know, I'm very fortunate in my family. Like, uh, uh, you know, I come from a family of, like, teachers. My sisters are, like, a, a, um, a, an art teacher. So we're, we're all about learning and kind of, like, crafting. And my, my dad uh, has eased up on the Hollywood industry, and they're, they're, they're cool with me doing what I do. Uh, he doesn't come up first to mind as far as being super negative, but it brings up a good point. Is like if you're trying to uh, start a, a venture or or follow your passion, you really need to get your tribe. You need to get the circle of it, uh, close friends. It doesn't need to be a lot, but you need to really know who's going to be on your side. And I, I'm not saying like don't get constructive criticism, but it, understanding that constructive criticism is exactly what you need, but they, they're all not super negative just shooting you down. And that's how you really put roots, doing something risky. Because for the most part, those are the minority. It's finding those friends and finding those people who you can really rely on when the days are good, when the days are bad. Because um, the other thing it reminds me of is like, you know, super negative people. It reminds me of the war of art. So it's like if you're ever doing it, the war, war of art is, first of all, if you're chasing your dream, no one's going to be rooting for you. So, so as long as you understand that, War of Art, I, I suggest for everyone, but mm -hmm. you know, as long as you, you know that that's the base level, don't be surprised when you're like, hey, I don't know why people aren't rooting for me or they might be secretly jealous even though they're friends and it's not, it's not any ill will, but that's because it's really scary to go after your passion. And to be honest, most people aren't willing to take that risk regardless of what it is, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it, it's finding that tribe and knowing what voices to, to, um, to, to, you know, like you said, you're, you're filtering out. So, yeah. yeah. And tell me more about finding your tribe. When did it feel like you found kind of a good supportive network? I can't pinpoint the original day. Um, but I was very blessed to come out here with, with some, I, I, as crazy as, as our journey was, I wouldn't have been able to imagine driving cross country by myself. To give you an idea, me and, and my, my, my buddy, Danny Lee, we, we, we went to college together. We, we drove cross country. My car wasn't, was old back then. So you can imagine we had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of unknowns. We didn't know if the car was going to break down. We didn't know any of that stuff. Um, there are some nights we, we slept in the car, not, not surprisingly. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have him. Other than that, it was, uh, um, you know, what circles did I have? Basically at work. And then other than that, you just kind of live life. But the, the main thing I would say is, because we're talking about the cultural differences, a lot of people have trouble finding a tribe in LA. They feel like the, the stereotypes are LA is flighty, superficial. I mean, obviously a lot of those stereotypes are, are Hollywood related, but I've been really fortunate. First of all, this is also low expectations too. I wasn't going into LA saying that everyone's going to be fake and I'm going to be so turned off. 
I was pretty young and I was kind of just finding, you know, growing into to who I was. Um, you know, I, 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 someone told me this years, years later, but, you know, a lot of East Coast transplants eventually moved out to L.A. And not all of us hate it. I don't hate L.A. Um, but they told me that good people find good people. And I found it to be true. I found it to be true that I found good people. I wasn't like I was searching for it. It wasn't like I was joining a bunch of like groups online. To be honest, groups online wasn't even really a thing back then. But when it comes down to it, I was living life. Um, uh, uh, some people I work with, I'm still friends after all these years. And obviously we're not, we're not still at Urban Outfitters, but um, I made lifelong friends and I wasn't even searching. I was just, I just became good friends with certain people and we attracted each other. So it wasn't like a mastermind plan, but it was, it was pretty organic. And, um, but that being said, there is hope because a lot of East Coasters come out here and they're like, I hate it for two years. And I, I think a lot of East Coasters, you've got to give it at least two years. Yeah, yeah. Because LA is so different. You've got to give it at least two years and maybe you'll like LA. But that's not to say that you're not meant to be here and, and pursuing your passion. But anyway, if that answers your question, yeah, I, I don't think does. I'm right, but it, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And that's part of the reason why I stuck around here. Yeah, it's so interesting because I've tried to explain this to people too. People are like, uh, you know, friends and all, how'd you find them? And it's the same thing. Um, I thought I was the only one to like phrase it that way, but you literally took the words out of my mouth. Good people kind of just find good people eventually. You got to give it time. But good people do find good people. And, you know, I'm so glad you said it because I was, I was actually just on YouTube on one of my other channels trying to explain that to people. Like, I wish I could give you better advice, but I, I guess it just sort of worked out. But, like, I guess what I was missing from my explanation to that guy is it took time. Yeah. It took time. It took a lot of filtering, too. Because uh, what you realize is the good people you meet, sometimes they – themselves in their circles have some bad people too. So then you can't just like, okay, I meet this one good person. I'm going to be friends with all his friends because some of his friends actually are very negative. So like, you know, like that's something I had to learn too. But like you said, like if you give it time, the beauty about this world is that eventually you'll find other good people like you. Assuming you're a good person. Now, if you're a bad person, probably there's another method to the madness. <laughs> we try to promote good people on this channel. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's also one of those things where it's like, it's not like you said, you give it time. It's kind of like, I, you know, I don't want to compare it to dating or whatever, but it's not like you can pre-plan. I'm going to make a, a lifelong friends for 10 years. Yeah. It's like also the beauty of what we do. The acting world can be really isolated, but just imagine if you, if you're on set, uh, you're, you're basically with a crew of 15, maybe more people day in, day out, making side little conversations. I remember like, you know, I did a small job and, and I was shooting a job for, for what ended up being a long time. And he was from Jersey. And we, 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 we got along. He was actually brand new to LA. And we just kind of hit it off. And, and literally to this day, after all these years, we're, you know, close friends. And uh, we, we talk all the time. And it's just one of those things. It's not like I was hunting for that. You just got to... Be yourself and, and you know, it just, it just kind of happens organically if, you, if you're not, you know, searching for it so hard. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Um, yeah. Recently, I had something similar after I moved back to L.A. again and then I, I met this guy and, you know, he, he turned out to be a really great guy. It, it, it's like I didn't plan on it either. It just happened that he knew one of my friends and then me, and I met him and then me and him got along. So it's like the other thing I would also say to uh, viewers about this friendship question, especially nowadays, it's, you know, it's hard. The number of close friends everyone has is getting lower and lower. But um, if you do find someone good, treasure that too. That's a piece of advice I would give too. Like if you do find someone good, treasure that too. And that's something I had to learn as I got older because I think I didn't have many good friends in high school. I didn't have many good friends in college. I had good friends in middle school and elementary school that I still keep in touch with. But man, middle, um, high school, college were like a dark period in my life. I didn't have any good friends. Part of it was just because I was lost. So probably the energy I was giving off wasn't the right energy. Exactly. But like, I mean, it's also like you're younger, you know what I mean? You, became, yeah. you become an adult, most likely, like most people become an adult, like after college, yeah. maybe, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So once I kind of maybe found myself more in LA. I started, I guess, being able to recognize when someone was a really good friend. And then it's like, okay, how do I keep them in my life? I'll take initiative more. If they're not the type to take initiative, I'm just going to do it. Right. Those right. are some things, but all of it has to do with, you just got to give it time. Again, we're talking about the time, the marathon, you got to give it time. You have to learn these things. And every city is different too. Right? So you have to learn how do you determine 
what, when someone's not flaky, when someone's a good person. It's, it's different in every city, especially in a place like LA where like Econ says, there's the stereotype that people are flaky and stereotypes are based on some truth, but sometimes the stereotypes are not based on truth either. So you got to figure out when someone fits the stereotype, when someone might fit the stereotype, but they actually are not fitting the stereotype, et cetera. Right. It takes time. Right. And it's also one of those things is like, uh, uh, I feel like, well, I, I just heard recently that older people, so they're, they're doing studies, but older people have uh, um, less superficial, superficial friends and more good friends. So basically, they, they, they're saying that as people grow older and more experienced and mature, they are valuing close relationships, which I, th which I think is like just wisdom experience. And I, I think that's, that's also really natural where it's like, you, you know, when you're in college or, or growing up, sure, you want as many friends as, as, you know, you can have. But as you start living life, you realize how much more meaningful having close relationships are. So yeah. I think it's a testament to that, just growing up a little bit. Yeah. So, Ikan, let's start talking about the acting journey. When was that first time, let's say, whether it was for an audition or something, you're like, oh, I did it. And then like you got on some show or you got on some movie and you're like, wow, I think I'm getting somewhere. Tell me more about you know, that. You know what's so funny? Like before I forget, that makes me think of a, a job in particular, but you know, without a doubt, when people say, when is the job that you, to make you feel like you made it? To be honest, I think that job never exists. Because when it comes down to it, this is a, it's also kind of cliche. It's like, when you think that you booked the big thing, it's like, you're going to be huge. It never happens. Mm. That being said, I'm sure if someone books a series regular and then they really feel like they made it, but you know, in all honesty, your life doesn't really change and you're still grudging around and, and you know, so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. you know, it kind of goes back to the idea of expectations. When you start realizing that every audition, you feel like you, you, you got it. And then you don't hear the phone ring. <laughs> The more you can escape that feeling after an audition, the more you're going to survive the marathon. Just have a short-term memory. If you get the job, great. But don't be hanging on every audition because you're going to drive yourself insane. That being said, uh, one of the first really fun jobs that I did was, um, and it wasn't necessarily super glamorous, but looking back on it, I, was, I don't, I don't uh, regret it. So basically... Um, they were looking for Asian pirates for the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is around, I, I don't remember which Caribbean it was, but I just wanted to see Johnny Depp. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a shot. And, you know, to be fair, it's like they had a bunch of Asian pirates and, and they actually really did auditions, which I'm, I'm kind of blown away. And some of them I actually remember from way back in those days. Basically, every Asian, all different types, I could probably pass. I'm a little more clean cut now, but... You know, I could pass. It was the full nine. I got the job. I was, it was the full nine. Days of work. We were speedboated out over by Hawthorne Beach or whatever, or Hawthorne or, or Hermosa Beach or whatever, to the real Black Pearl, the actual ship. And that was our morning every morning. We're dressed up as pirate. We got fake makeup or dirty makeup and faked out, uh, black, blacked out teeth. And that was our life. It was the greatest thing ever. And I was like, I just want to see Johnny Depp. I was like, uh, 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 just being on the Black Pearl. And just, you know, it's not glamorous being essentially sitting around for hours. But just that moment, I was like, oh, man, this is I, – I, I, I soaked it in. And I, 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 I love that moment. I did not think I was going to be a superstar. But it was how I look at most jobs where appreciate it, appreciate for what it is, what you can learn. Um, and you know, we had gun training for that. We were, we were blowing up fake guns and, and fake cannons. We had, we had to be safe, safe on set. Yeah. Anyway, the reason why I bring that up is, is, is it's, it's it going back to my point. There's never one job that is going to be the permanent job or, or the, 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 it's never going to be a life forever. These, every shoot's going to end. Unfortunately, if you're on a show and you know, obviously everyone dreams about being on a show for seven years and you have this family, but when it comes down to it, the family could last for a day. The family could last for five, five days. And it kind of, uh, um, in a way, it's kind of bittersweet where it's like, I love these guys. And, and like you said, it's like if you have someone that you want to keep in your life and become friends with, you kind of like make that initiative. Yeah, yeah. But as far as the industry is concerned, no, it's, it's small building blocks. That was a great experience. And you keep 
uh, that has nothing to do with the craft. I think maybe I was like, I looked like an Asian pirate and they liked me. And then that was enough for that. But it's like, that was, you know, when we talk about craft and going to class and trudging and really working on, on the auditions, I mean, like we said that there's no timeline, but, um, you know, it's so up and down. It's so up and down. And I think that that's the beauty of what we do. It's like, if you thought that acting was going to be a straight linear path, you have no idea what you're getting into. If you're studying accounting business, you're going to B school, that's going to be a lot more linear than um, crushing an audition you're perfect for and then going out for something the next day and it's horribly wrong for you and you feel like you're a failure. It's like, that is, you know, we're adrenaline junkies for the most part. If, you're, if, you, if you can't handle the risk and reward, then, you know, it, acting talent aside, it might not be a, a great industry. But that's kind of like how I look at the ups and downs of, of what we do. Uh, and you never really know either. It's like you can't count yourself out. It's like, say, for example, your mom saying that, oh, the percentage of you starting your own business or the percentages are really bad. It's like that's the, that's the logic that people used to believe until you break that. So it's like you can't be living those lies and you can't be – like what's the point of, of following bad uh, – um, illusions yeah. that's just what people who are playing it safe uh followed after all these years and then you just got to throw it out yeah so, um yeah. since we're using the analogy of running so much it reminds me i don't remember if it's the 50 meter sprint or something for a while there was one sprint category where the scientists were like yeah anatomically physiologically it's impossible for you to break a certain mark and then some guy broke it some i think it was a lady some lady broke it and then ever since then everyone just going broke breaking that record right it's, it's the same exact thing understanding people's understanding is just limited you know whether you take a biblical perspective or something we're human everyone can admit nobody knows nobody's omniscient nobody's omnipotent so like just because some expert says it or someone who's ha walked a similar or not so similar path before says you can't do it doesn't mean you can't do it yeah I completely agree. I completely agree. And it's also in, in like, it, it, like going back to like, you know, not just acting, but it's the creative industry. Yeah. It's like, there's a lot of unknowns where that's, that's the, the part of the game. It has nothing to do with innate talent. It's, it, you know, if you really want to do it, work at it. It doesn't matter whether you're a fine artist or, or a, a, a sculptor. It's the, the name of the game is there's a lot of unknown. Uh, if you're making a small business, it's a lot of unknown and, you know, you're in it for the experience, hopefully, but also it's like, you know, you know, what's, what's ahead of you. You know that the numbers are not against you, but you know, if that's what you want to do, then you, you do it. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's talk about if people look at your IMDb, the latest entry is NCIS. So let's talk about NCIS when you play like a bad guy. How was that? Tell me about the whole process of getting the role and then like playing a villain. You know, it's so funny. It's like, I'm not sure. Like the story itself is really, especially the fact that you know Chinese. Um, so uh, I was playing a bad guy on NCIS, not a super bad guy, but like a bad guy who's kind of like lost in the mix. And then it's like a father son story and so on. But the funny thing is, and I, I actually wonder if it so happened that uh, the production or, or casting directors here of, say, for example, like my audition experience, I wonder what they would think. But the funny thing is, uh, uh, and this gives an insight of like as far as like uh, a diversity and where we are. Um, first of all, it was a great experience. And, and I, okay, well, actually, let me start with this. I auditioned for that show. Um, no less than 30 times okay, before I booked it. This is over years. Okay. So basically I was getting that, that, um, that experience and that kind of rapport with the casting directors and the producers. But just imagine going into the same office 30 times and not getting it. Okay. So it's, I'm not even exaggerating. To be honest, it's more than 30. So me, you have to sh have a short-term brain, but also there are a lot of times where I, I, I don't want to go in here again. There's a lot of time that I, I'm going to die and never be on the show. 
I mean, also keep in mind it's NCIS, NCIS LA, and then uh, New Orleans. So, so it was kind of daunting, and you have to fight that psychological uh, barriers. Anyway, this role was kind of perfect. Uh, um, you know, I fit the type, and so on and so forth. There was lines of trainees. I don't really know trainees. Okay, I wish I did. My parents know trainees. And so when I get an audition, I drill it with my mom. She teaches it to me and I learn phonetically. And I really, really drill it. And I have to really know it because, you know, it's one thing to speak the Chinese. It's another thing to actually do the acting. Anyway, so first audition, flub the Chinese. It wasn't a big deal because I knew it was the first audition and then they would, uh, uh, hopefully they would call back for the, the main one in front of the producers and all that. So I go back, uh, I, I get called back because I was like, to be honest, no one knew what my Chinese was saying anyway. So in that first one, it was a practice run. I flubbed it. They didn't even know when I was done saying my lines. And this gives an idea of like uh, 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 how serious it is for, say, a huge network show of proper Chinese. I mean, they didn't really care. Okay. I don't want to – my experience on NCIS was great, so I don't want to make it sound like they were incompetent. They, they were great. Going back to the second audition, uh, uh, producers – 15 people, 20 people in a, in a tiny room, same daunting room that I could not quote unquote conquer for 30 times. I, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to give it my all. And I kid you not, by the time that I got halfway through the Chinese, okay, I froze. I blanked out. And I think the casting directors knew that there was more Chinese for me to say. So there was a pause and I wasn't sure there was, I saw the eyes of the, 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 the one reading uh, opposite me and he was a little frozen. He didn't know whether to jump in. And I legitimately said a few lines of Chinese gibberish, like literally gibberish. I'm talking about like gobbledygook, whatever came out of my mouth and just trying to own it. I owned it. I, I finished the scene. I, I tried to have my head uh, 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 held up high, finished the audition, and I just said, thank you. <laughs> like, literally, it's like, it's like uh, one of those figure skaters who, like, topple over, and then they finish the, 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 the performance as if nothing happened, and then they bow, and then, you know, they're like, okay, that was exactly what I was planning on doing, and then you walk out. I'm not going to lie. I was kicking myself so hard walking out because I was like, that was my chance and I completely blew it. And then of course, the next day I got the call that I booked it. So that gives you an idea. And this was like, you know, one of my, my, my bigger, bigger roles as far as, first of all, it was a, a, it was a huge show. It's drama. It's been on for literally 16 years. This was the 16th season. Um, anyway, fast forward after that experience, I was like, I need to practice this Chinese even more. And, uh, and also, I wanted to get to this point. So uh, NCIS gave up props to them because this is how good they were. They actually had a Chinese translator send me all the Chinese that they wanted me to say. And uh, they gave me audio. I was able to learn it down cold, and I was more than prepared going into the set. So it's not like they didn't care about whatever Chinese was spoken on set. But leading up to it, I like to say that, you know, finally after all those tries, uh, uh, you know, God, you know, was on my side, however you want to call it. Um, but that was that particular job. And I'll, I'll never forget that I got the monkey off my back because 30 times, more than 30 times. And if anything, that's the marathon that we're talking about because most people wouldn't have survived 30 times. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like, it's almost unbelievable, you know? Anyway, so that's, that's how that was. I'm so thankful you shared that with us because most people don't realize, you know, the, the, most people see the glamour side. They see that, oh, Econ, you know, Econ played the bad guy. He did a good job as a bad guy. You know, um, uh, I forgot the name of the famous actor that played your father, but, you know, he, he, he's very famous, oh, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Francois Chow. Francois Chow, he was the original shredder in the Teen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. among other things. But, yeah. No, it was an honor to have him play my dad. Yeah. And so, like, great. people yeah. see that, but they don't see that, wow. Econ tried out at least 30 times before to get on NCIS. Like yeah. this is, I'm glad you're, you're, you're like sharing this piece of vulnerability because people, 
see the acting, they just don't realize why, you know, why someone would, would like spend five years. Why would it take five years or 10 years, right? Because it's so competitive and there's so much X factors. Like you said, you flood the Chinese during the first kind of thing, but I guess you still owned it enough that they were like, oh, versus someone, let's say, whose Chinese was perfect. Maybe they didn't own it enough. The casting director might have been like, oh, this person, I mean, technically is good, but we don't feel it. We don't feel it, man. Exactly. And that's a great point. Obviously, we're not going to get into the weeds about acting and stuff like that. But as an actor, first of all, if you come up, go out of an audition and you think that it was horrible, chances are you're completely wrong. And if you thought it was really great, you, pr you probably are wrong. So it's like you got to throw out that barometer of like doing a good job. But mm -hmm. also the things that we think are important, saying the Chinese perfectly, doing a good job, after a while you see that the actors who, you know, and I'm, I'm still learning, so I don't want to be like I'm Meryl Streep, but, but you realize the things that you thought were important and whether it was acting school or even like just growing up and trying to do a good job, you realize how little important it is. Um, and you got to be in the moment and you got to take things with, you got to be a human being. And the funny, funny thing is, on set, my first day of speaking the Chinese was in Marina Del Rey with six series regulars, and the first shot of the day was me speaking the Chinese to the uh, uh, to my uh, the person that played my father. So my the first shot of the day at eight a.m. for a show that's been on for sixteen years and six series regulars. And I was speaking a language that I don't speak. So that was, you know, there's always an experience and there's always a funny story and there's always a thing. You just soak it, soak it up and then hope you survive and then, you know, take it from there. But um, yeah, anyway, I thought, that, I thought that was funny too. Wow. That's <laughs> so crazy. That's so crazy, man. Wow. Um, so, um, Ika, what is next for you? Tell me about that. What do you got planned in your artistic journey? What do you got planned in other things? You know, it, it's so funny. It's like, you know, and I, I, I feel like all this stuff and how I look at, you know, the industry and, and the things that I'm doing and, and kind of like how I look at, you know, essentially my years here in L.A., I look at it the same way as I did before, before COVID happened. And I feel like there's a lot of unknowns that happen in our industry. For us to, and I, like, it, it would be remiss for me to say, Hey, the industry, you know, it, it hasn't changed at all uh, right now. And I, I look at, you know, I look at the next month exactly how I did, you know, a year ago. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, our industry is on a serious hiatus right now. And there's so many things that we don't know. So I just want to establish that, that we're not in a complete bubble. It's like, you got to roll with the punches. <laughs> my, my iPhone just went off. Nice. Uh, uh, so... The, um, give me a second. <laughs> so you, you, we can't live in a bubble and there's so many unknowns about the industry. Um, but regardless of the ups and downs, it's keep working on your craft. Um, say for example, the question, what are you working on next? It's like, first of all, I don't know anyone who's going to be working on anything next, let alone me. me. But that being said, you can always keep keep working so you know we didn't really talk about it that much but um you know probably a few years ago i got the experience of me and my writing partner who i've been writing for years we started writing we started producing we created our own uh, uh no budget low budget shoot that we uh were the stars of the show we wrote produced it i created my own crew i brought people who um to, to run camera and this was, you know, we're in complete control. This is our film school. This is exactly what we want to do. And this is exactly what uh, the first step to becoming maybe the filmmaker that I wanted to do because I was starting to think about writing and producing and, and, and directing a little bit more. Anyway, that being said, I'm so glad that I had that experience because I'm still writing. That, that was years ago. Uh, that, 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 that web series that we started out with is, is called Born Losers and it, it, it's – it's online, it's on YouTube, Instagram, and all that stuff. A Boy Losers TV. Um, but, you know, that was our baby show where I taught myself how to edit, I taught myself how to color correct, and I gave no one else excuses except I'm just going to learn all this stuff. Um, that was the important work that I needed to do 
Um, and what, what, what people's feedback, you know, luckily everyone really, really enjoyed it. And it was us getting better at writing and, and, and acting. But most importantly, that was the stuff that we needed to do that, say, for example, when this moment happened and, and we're on, uh, you know, extended hiatus, I write with my writing partner and we haven't lost a beat. If anything, obviously we write a lot more, but all the work fed into where we are now. We shot uh, a web series. Actually, so this, this stuff are, are some of the, the uh, uh, awards we got, um, but it's our web series. You know, we did a short film that, uh, that was my first time directing, and that was kind of like the journey of constantly learning new skills. There was no pressure. No one was saying that, oh, hey, I, am I going to stop acting just because I became a director? No. It was getting a better understanding, and they all feed into each other. Anyway, kind of like on, on your point, um, you know, learning new skills, that's the main thing. And it's like, I feel like, you know, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a tricky time for everyone and everyone's different, but this was the time to start learning new skills, whether it's getting better at writing, getting better at directing. And, uh, funny enough, and I actually started this before I, um, before, uh, COVID really hit us here in the States. Um, I started doing voiceover, which ironically voiceover is the one thing that our industry can do safely. So, so I was already starting to get into it. I'm taking class. I have my own equipment. I'm recording voiceover at home and I'm able to build those skills, but it's constantly, constantly learning, building those skills. Um, and funny enough to your point, and I, I, I can't even tell you how grateful I am. Um, besides, you know, what show or movie that any of us are going to shoot next. Um, we actually, well, I, I was fortunate enough to shoot a commercial during COVID. Mm. Uh, all this is brand new. And it literally started airing uh, yesterday. Yesterday as of like, as we're speaking to each other right now. Wow. Um, it's, it's huge. I, I, you know, I, 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 can, I can say it now because it's already, it, it's airing. It, it, it was actually for Facebook. Oh. So, so there's a huge commercial. And here's the thing. It's like, it's also the ups and downs of our industry. If you like, if you're in the industry and you're thinking about the long term, you have to understand that these things are going to take a, a permanent or uh, 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 extended hiatus. Meaning what are you going to do to stay sane? How are you going to continue to work on your craft? What can you work on your skills and still uh, 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 survive what we don't know it's, it's going to end. Um, that being said, some productions are actually starting up. Some commercials primarily, um, they're getting, they're finding some actors and they're able to shoot safely at home, meaning that I'm being directed by, you know, um, actually this is not a secret, uh, also uh, a funny, funny tidbit, like the director of the commercial was Oscar winner, uh, Oscar winner Michelle Gondry. So um, that experience alone is, is crazy, but when it comes down to it, we're directed online. We're shooting. It's a brand new thing. This is literally no more than three weeks ago. It's airing, and we have the fortunate uh, experience of making some money. I would never expect an actor to make uh, money in this in this crazy culture right now. But when it comes down to it, uh, 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 embrace the ups and downs. Uh, right now, is our industry is completely unknown. Take the victories uh, with with the failures and and, and keep chugging uh, keep chugging along. Um, either way, the next uh, short term or whatever, me and my my writing partner that I've been you know the the web series and all that stuff, uh, we're still working, we're still crafting out and developing a couple pilots. And um, other than that, still I, I'm still acting class even even on Zoom. Um, I'm still learning as far as acting, but uh, you know, I'm reading tons of books regarding whether it's writing, uh, uh, directing still, you know, and, uh, and you know, I, I, like you, you, you're, we're kind of like similar. We're kind of like Jack of all trades and we are really curious. It's like, you, you gotta have some kind of balance. It's like, you know, what, what else are you going to do? That's completely separate from it. Like, of course I'm baking, you know, everyone's baking. So I'm baking, cooking tons at home, which I love. Um, you know, my sister is, is our teacher. I have a bunch of, a uh, bunch of art supplies starting to draw, starting to paint. So, um, you know, they all help each other, but 
that's pretty much uh, a, a lot of what, what I'm doing now. And, you know, who knows? When they start being creative with productions, people are going to start auditioning. People are doing self-tapes. You can still bridge connections with casting directors. They're having a lot of open calls, and they're meeting a lot of people online. Um, so the work, the work never stops. It's just, you know, like, it, like we, we said before, it's the, the marathon and not the sprint. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll brace through this time. Yeah. Exactly. I, yeah. I love it. And for viewers watching, um, all the stuff that Econ talks about, I'll have links in the description and pinned comments so you guys can go down and see. You guys can see a show. You guys can see some of the people he's worked with, that book he recommended. It'll all be there. So for those of you who've watched it this far, you will see it in the description and the pinned comments. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, the, the key word this year is pivot. It's being taught a lot, right? It's being tossed around a lot. 2020 is the year of pivoting, man. doesn't mean pivot out of your endeavors or pivot out of your entrepreneurial path, but pivot within your entrepreneurial path to gain new customers, new viewers, whatever you're think, aiming for. I think it's a great point that you said that because pivoting, it's, it's kind of like a lot of people can have a, a negative connotation to it. Yeah. Because I, I think it goes back to what is your ego and your pride saying that I quote unquote fail, that's why I'm changing direction. Yeah. It's the same thing as saying like an entrepreneur or an actor or saying that I don't want to have a side job because it makes people think less of what I do. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you put your ego aside, it goes back to longevity, it goes back to you know surviving and and to be honest, you're probably gonna be happier. There's no there's no way that you would expect what you wanted it six years ago or the person you were six years ago and assume that you're going to be that same person. I mean, if anything, people are always changing and, and you know, there, there's a, there's a moment where you can really be honest with yourself. Yeah. yeah. And especially right now, I think, I think this is the best time that a lot of people are kind of, you kind of in this stillness in this quiet, you can be a little more honest with yourself yeah. and see, see what really matters to you. So yeah. I think it's a great point. And, um, like Econ says, uh, me personally, I actually let me just let me just really quickly do a little funny drawing. Actually, this might not work because I can't find my pen. Actually, here it is. Awesome. So he, here's what I think about when I think about pivoting. Right? F think within. So this is like let's say this is the creative path you're doing. You can pivot this way out of it, or you can pivot within. You know, you see, you still have a lot of room within. This is the crazy Jerry mind working. So you don't have to go out of here. You know, move industry, but you could pivot within like this. <laughs> so no, I, I used that. to draw that when, when we were debating free will versus determinism and philosophy, mm -hmm. right? How how free is free will? How deterministic is your future? Wow. And I would always draw something like this. I'm like, maybe there's bounds to your free will, but still, you still have some choice within the bounds. So wow. <laughs> we're getting really deep here. But I gotta say, your drawing reminds me of like those uh, uh, those whiteboards when they're uh, the, like the football coaches are like drawing up plays. <laughs> but I, I do love the fact that, you know, especially in, in, in what we're talking about, at least the way I look at filmmaking, um, when you talk about producing, writing, directing, acting, it, you, you realize that they're not that, they're not that different from each other. And, and um, they're, they're degrees off kind of just like your drawing uh, showed. And uh, they're all in that same world, and they all help each other. Like, directing is going to help your acting and vice versa and, and so on and so forth. So we're very fortunate to have that mindset where we can do a bunch of different things and, and, and learn that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah How do you pivot to help what you're doing, right? And that's why uh, right before um, I jumped on this talk with Econ, I was practicing my drawing. It's something I've always wanted to learn. And my thought is I'm not going to become – only an animator, but my thought is the drawing aspect will help me in my creative journey too. Because now if I have an idea, I don't have to just describe it. I can draw it for people. If I don't want to be on screen on YouTube, I can draw myself, right? That's the thought. So it's like, that's the type of pivot that both Econ and I are talking about. For Econ, it's like, dude, he likes the act, but what if sometimes there's not roles or there, there's no production? Well, he can write stuff for himself and his friends. Yeah, and it's a great point because it's, it's, it's ultimately communication. Yeah. You can articulate what's in your head if you could draw it. Uh, if you could draw it better or articulate it, then you can, uh, uh, someone else can see and have a better idea what you're, what you're doing. Um, a lot of people, say for example, it could be drawing or writing for the first time. It's back to, it brings them back to grade school when they're realizing 
hey, I'm not good at this. I'm really scared. I hate this or I'm a bad student. And it's allowing yourself to be curious, like learning a new hobby, giving yourself that, that compassion that, hey, I'm just going to try this and, 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 and give it a whirl and see where it goes. And maybe you'll, maybe you'll love it. But it's allowing yourself to, to, uh, um, to not be great at them, something and learn something new. And on that note, I don't know if you, if you know this book, um, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Have you ever heard of it? Oh, I've not heard of it. Tell me more. Oh, it's by Betty Edwards. And I, I got a shout out to my acting teacher, uh, uh, Leslie Kahn. She is the one that introduced it to me. Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain touches on that exact thing. It's the exact thing where if you are trying to draw, mm -hmm. you're, it's built in with all the childhood barriers that we were told that were not good, the things that we're scared of. And um, that's why some people either draw at, when they're young and they realize that they're gifted and they were affirmed or they just never drew. And they actually walk through exercises. Essentially, he has, uh, she actually has real, real workshops. Um, well, I, I, to be fair, I don't know if the author is still doing them. I don't, uh, to be honest, I, this, this book is from a while ago. So, um, but she goes through exercises that teaches anybody how to draw from like literally anybody. So, so her workshop is, is taking someone with no skill, no training and working them through step by step, battling all the bad, bad notions that they had by tricking their brain. And they're drawing, um, uh, 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 advanced level stuff in months. So you would, you would love this. So like, especially since you're already honing your, your ability to draw, it, it's another way of looking at art. And my acting teacher showed me that book. So, the, the parallel is that's the same thing that we can learn anything, but drawing is a way of artistically getting out of our um, left, left side of the brain. That's why it's called drawing on the right side of the brain, getting in that artistic free side of it. So any artist, non-artist, someone who's interested in drawing, I definitely check out that book because I, I, I literally have been reading it and using it you know, these days right now. So um, anyway. I yeah. will put that in the description and pin comments too, man. Econ, thank you. That's it. I was looking, I was going to get supplies anyways from Amazon. I was going to get, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's like, um, it's a tool you can blend. So you don't use your hands or use a tissue, but you can blend when you're doing like, Oh um, yeah. Yeah. I know. I heard about yeah, that. I was going to get one of those. So now it's, it's another reason for me because I was like, Oh, do I want to order on Amazon just for that? Well, now I can order this book in addition to that. Exactly. Exactly. And there's out. something I have to say um, to add on to what you're saying about all this is that I had a crisis moment two days ago when I'm like, what is the point of this? Oh my God, I'm not making enough progress with my drawing. But then I got past it and I kept drawing. And mm -hmm. I think learning a new hobby, it will break some of those patterns that you were talking about when you were a kid. You're like, oh my God, I hate drawing. I can't draw. If you can get them every time you experience a new triumph of, well, I'm going to do it anyways. Right? That helps your brain. So it's not just about neuroplasticity. It's also breaking some of those bad pathways. So it's not just building new pathways, which are important, but it's also breaking some bad pathways too. You know, you bring up a great point. And this is like a little, you know, obviously this is just something that I found to be really true. And it also kind of helps me with the, the, the psychological aspect. A lot of this, this marathon idea is, is really psychological. So say for example, whether you're, whether your preconceived notions of where you are or how successful you are, you're always going to have those doubts. If you talk to your family back home, you're always going to have those doubts because they don't even understand what the journey is. Yeah. But really, it's, it's kind of like what you're saying is like battling all the, all, all the negative voices. It, say I'll use commercials because uh, this, this happens up a lot. But as an actor, if you're going to an audition and you're thinking of, I need this money, I need this job, I need to do a good job, and then you're up against an actor who is not even really an actor and very well does acting for fun. He has a full-time job, has a family, and he breaks away to go on commercial auditions because he can make money and he has a good look. As free and as open as he is, he's always going to have an advantage over you. It's because he doesn't have the expectations. He doesn't have the pressure of money and in a commercial audition, which is uh, a lot less, um, you know, a lot less intensive than, say, you know, 
NCIS or, or, or you know, a, a TV job. But when it comes down to it, it's a perfect example of being free, allowing yourself to fail, but also not having those expectations and all that pressure. You're already going to be shooting yourself in the foot if you have that mentality. So I think that's just a tidbit as far as, you know, don't quit your day job. If it's flexible and it doesn't destroy your spirit, you know, you, you live for another, you live for another uh, bite at the apple and you live for another day. So um, mm -hmm. it brings up a great point. You're not battling those pressures that yeah. I'm not good or, or where am I right now? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if a job gets too much and you're forced to quit it, don't put off the thing of, oh, I will never have a job again. Like, I still talk to recruiters. Sometimes it's just, I'm very selective, right? So, you know, a recruiter will present me an opportunity and usually I'm like, no, or, you know, I, I interview with the company and in my mind, I'm like, F this, right? But I still open myself to that because like Econ said, if I can have a job that gives me the flexibility and they treat me well, they appreciate me, then why not have it and do my own thing? But right now I haven't found it. But the beauty is you have to be open to everything. That's the key. I completely agree. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's also a great lesson for relationships. Yeah. Relationships, whether it's in your industry or not in your industry, it's learning, uh, meeting someone new, having a conversation, and even a conversation, you're going to discover new things or even practice interviewing. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, that's a great point. You yeah. never say, you know, always give, always be open to what, what could be around the corner. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, for those of you watching, Let's end it here, but I'll definitely bring back Econ. I know he's going to have a lot of exciting things for the future. So this is the time for viewers now. If you want to share, please share it. If you want to ask questions, you can put the questions in the comment section, and maybe next time we can answer some of your viewer questions. So um, Econ, again, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, this was a great so talk, man. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, viewers, I'm signing off here. And for everyone else watching, um, if you stumble on this later and, you know, it's five years later, ten years later, thank you. This was one of the first interviews on this channel. Thank you, Econ. Nice.